Heavenly Father, I pray that the words of my lips and the meditation of each and every one of our hearts would be good and pleasing in your sight, our Lord, our rock, and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Our message tonight comes from the reading that was read a few minutes ago before, the, before communion that Greg read, especially that very last line when in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he was being taken prisoner, Jesus said these words in Luke twenty two fifty three. He said, this is your hour, the power of darkness. You remember Christmas Eve? <laughs> I know it was a while ago, but... Christmas Eve uh, in, in here in, in worship, you know, how beautiful it was. We had the, the big beautiful wreath. We had the Christmas tree here and, and the, the beautiful lights under it. I loved how the, how the tree was lit up, not only the tree itself, but the lights that were lit up under it just glowing, you know, the, the, white, the white sheet under it was just glowing. And we had that big beautiful wreath. And of course, our cross glows so beautifully. And, and you know, when, when you were all gathered in here, we had all those candles, right? And we were all sitting here and from the oldest to the youngest, every single person had a candle. And we came to the end of the service, we turned off the lights and lit the candles and sang Silent Night. And it's so beautiful, so perfect, so pristine, so wonderful. It's a, a moment where we, we remember, we're reminded of everything that's good and, and everything that's beautiful. And we're reminded that there is and really can be and, tru- and really truly can be peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Tonight's different, though. <laughs> the sanctuary is a little bit different tonight. It's just as beautiful. I don't know where we got all these beautiful flowers and, and whatnot, but these are, these are absolutely gorgeous. Bringing a pop of color in here reminds me of Jesus there in the Garden of Gethsemane. The sanctuary is every bit as beautiful as it was on that Christmas, but different. Because here the story's taken a little bit of a turn. <laughs> it's interesting as we've been going through the Holy Week readings and listening to Seth's beautiful voice on the, uh, on the, the audio uh, devotions that we've gotten and, and gone through. I don't know if, how many of you guys ha- still have the, uh, the Easter eggs that were given to us from, uh, back in 2020 during COVID. Any parents still have the Easter eggs? You're going through them with your kids. We, we do. Uh, Rendy gave us those, the colorful Easter eggs back in the COVID year when we couldn't worship together. And we did the devotions oceans at home as a family, and we've been doing them. We've been using them ever since, and, and it was interesting. This morning, we went through the devotion, and we were talking about the Garden of Gethsemane, and as we were going through the Garden of Gethsemane, Allie, my daughter, pointed something interesting out that only a child, a 10-year-old, could point out, that, you know, and, and my wife and I realized this is, this is, you know, the beautiful things that a child comes up with. My daughter says to me, she says, I can't believe Jesus is old enough to die, Because, I mean, we were just celebrating his birthday like three months ago. (laughs) I'm like, well, I guess you're right. She's like, he's not even a year old yet. I was like, yeah, I guess you're right. I hadn't thought of that when you're, you know, 10 years old. You know, conceptually, you haven't even gone through a full year to celebrate a birthday. Of course, it seems odd. And no matter how much Becky and I tried to tell her, you know, he, he lived to be 33 when he died. She was like, but he's not even a year. It was just, she couldn't wrap her head around it. But here that baby that we celebrated that night is a man. Go ahead and imagine the scene with me. If you want to close your eyes, you can, or, or just think about it as I speak. It's the night of the Last Supper, and, and Jesus and his disciples had eaten, just like we've eaten, and, and he gave them the, the, the Last Supper. He gave them this meal and instituted the, the supper for us. The meal's over, and he says to his disciples, guys, we got to go. I got to pray. I got something heavy on my heart. So he goes to the garden, And he prays, and he prays, and he finds them asleep, and he wakes them up, and he goes and he prays again, and he finds them asleep, and he wakes them up, and he goes and he prays again, and here's something different happens. It's like the scene out of a monster movie, you know, I'm not going to ask how many of you guys like horror movies, but it's like the scene out of, a, out of an old monster movie. The villagers come out to get the monster, they come out to get Frankenstein, and they come out with what? Their forks, their pitchforks and torches and clubs. 
probably hiding in the bushes, maybe behind that bush over there or behind these bushes over here. And there they are hiding in the bushes, waiting for their signal. They're waiting. And I'm sure Jesus' disciples can hardly believe it when everything unfolds. Is it? Now, remember, it's a lot brighter in here than it would have been there, you know? I mean, you know, they didn't have street lights there. They didn't have the, the, the kind of ambient light that we have in our world today. Imagine how just so dark it would be. The only light you'd have is those torches and the moon. I'm sure the disciples could hardly believe it. Is, is that, is it really? I, 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 it can't be. Uh, is that Judas? They might ask as they're rubbing the sleep from their eyes as they've been falling asleep over and over and over again. He, he was just at dinner with us a few hours ago. What, we were wondering where he went. Hey, where, where'd Judas go? He, he's, he's back. They probably thought. Judas tells the soldiers as he ducks behind a bush, the one that I kiss, that's the one. That's Jesus. That's your target. So he makes his way towards his Lord, his friend. He slips past Jesus' defenses and he gives him a kiss on the cheek, the kiss of friendship, the kiss of brotherhood that we see so often in movies in other places that aren't America, you know, Italy and the Middle East. And, you know, that kiss that says, we are brothers, we are friends. We're united together. And in that moment, the trap is sprung. The soldiers jump out from behind the bushes. The priests, the religious leaders, they show themselves and Judas thinks that he's so sly. He thinks he's gotten away with it. He thinks that that, that all of his plans worked out perfectly, exactly the way he wanted and he caught Jesus off guard. But Jesus wasn't shocked. (laughs) Jesus knew exactly how this whole thing was going to play out. In fact, he'd spent the last several hours praying that God would give him strength to face it. He says to them when they come out from, behind, from their hiding and they come to him to arrest him, he says to them, have you come out to me as a robber, as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you didn't lay your hands on me. But this is your hour. This is the power of darkness. On Christmas Eve, it was so beautiful. It was dark in, the, in this room. It was dark all around us. And what did we do? We lit candles. We nestled in the warm glow of a thousand little lights on our Christmas tree and our wreaths and the, the candles we held in our hands. We sang Silent Night. But tonight is different. <laughs> the candles are gone. Well, most of them. Instead of silent night tonight, we hear the sound of a crowd and rattling swords. John, the book of John, tells us that Jesus is the light of the world. In fact, in John chapter 1 verse 5, it says, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. We saw that on Christmas Eve. No matter how dark we made it, those little lights, they brightened up the room. The darkness cannot overcome a candle. It can't overcome a halogen lamp. It can't overcome the light. Wherever light is, darkness flees. But tonight, it looks like darkness is coming pretty close to overcoming that light. In fact, at the end of the service, we're going to see that darkness start to encroach as we strip the altar and we see the darkness become more potent and powerful. For anyone who's ever been betrayed, you know the cut that it brings. You know the feeling that comes. The knife in the back is a wound like no other. But why? Because it's unexpected. It's unprotected. When you walk down dark alleys, when you're, when you're in a place that's unfamiliar and you've you got that creepy feeling, what do you do? You look over your shoulder, maybe you reach in your pocket and grab your mace or, you know, maybe you grab your, your, your knife or maybe if you're concealed carry, you grab your, you put your hand on your gun, whatever it is. But you, whatever you do, you make sure that you feel safe and protected because you don't feel safe in this moment. But betrayal's different. 
Betrayal's unexpected. In betrayal, the knife comes not from the scary guy who's walking down the street behind you, but rather the knife comes from the person who's supposed to have your back. The guy who's got your six, the th person you thought you could trust. That's what's so sinister. That's what catches us off guard. Uh, you see, that's true for you and me, but that's not true for Jesus, though. That's the interesting thing about our story. As I was thinking about this message, it hit me that none of the things that are true for us fit here tonight. Because Jesus wasn't caught off guard by Judas' betrayal. Because not only did Jesus know about it, but he prophesied it. Earlier in our reading, we heard Jesus say this, that while he was gathered at the table before he gave us the Lord's Supper, he said this in verse 21, but behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as, as it's been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another and say, who could it be? And they wondered which of them was going to do this. Jesus wasn't surprised. He wasn't shocked. He wasn't caught off guard. But still he allowed it to happen. Think about that. He allowed the darkness to have power. And he didn't back down. When you're trying to get away with something, what do you do? When we're trying to get away with something as kids or maybe big kids as adults, what do we do? We sneak around, we hide, we do things in the dark, we do things in secrets so that we can get away with it. We want to maintain what the military calls the element of surprise, right? <laughs> During dinner, Jesus, Judas was plotting and planning and scheming. He'd already gotten his 20 piece, 30 pieces of silver. He'd already talked to the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He'd already done all the work. All the plans were in motion. And in that one statement Jesus makes, that this guy, that someone at this table is going to betray me, <clears throat> Jesus turns a halogen lamp on all of Judas's sneaking around. It's like in those, you know, those movies where the, the bad guy's sneaking around along the wall, you know, the criminals are trying to get out of jail and they, they shine the spotlight, the you know, prison spotlight goes by and like, and then they wait for it to go by and they're like, okay, gotta, gotta go, gotta go. You know, that's what Judas was like. Jesus shines the light right on him. He turns the tables on Judas. He calls him out. How does he know? I, I'm caught. The cat's out of the bag. What do I do? Judas might have thought. Just think of it. If Jesus were like me, I don't know about you, but if, Ju if Jesus were like me, <laughs> what he might have done is he might have been like, hey, guys, told the, uh, the other 11, hey, that's the guy. Sick him. <laughs> he might have dimed him out. He might have called him out so that he wouldn't have had to go through what he was going to go through. Hey, Judas has been speaking to the chief priests. He's gotten 30 pieces of silver. He's betraying me. Guys, go take him out back and, and beat him up. But he didn't. And Jesus' restraint should have been enough to send a shudder through Judas's spinal column. Just think about that. Just think about that mercy that he was shown. Every gospel's clear. Every one of the gospels is clear that Jesus pointed out that this was going to happen, but Jesus was very cautious to protect Judas. He didn't dime him out. In fact, none of the disciples had any idea who it was, and Jesus was happy to keep it that way. Why? Why? Because Jesus was humbly following God's painful plan and allowing the darkness to snuff out his light. Because, you see, that's the power of this table. I was talking to one of our brothers the other day, well, a couple of weeks ago, after I preached that sermon that I preached, uh, you know, about, about various addictions in our world and, and the power of darkness in our world that we see so often. And, you know, I, 
something hit me after I preached that sermon and we took communion and I thought, you know, this is an interesting place we're at here because here the person who's been betrayed and the person who does the betraying can sit next to each other in forgiveness and mercy and grace and they're welcome. There's not many places in our world where that happens, where the betrayer and the betrayee can sit in forgiveness and eat together. (laughs) There's not many places where the criminal and the sheriff or the justice can mutually be together, but this place is one of those places. This table, this meal that we've just had is different from other meals that we experience in our world. Because it doesn't just feed our bellies. (laughs) It gives us grace. It gives us mercy. It gives us love and forgiveness in a tangible form. As you took that bread and you took that wine and you put it on your tongue and maybe you let it sit there and linger for a moment like I do, I hope you took in the power of what you were eating and drinking. The sourness of the wine, not insulting the wine, just, you know, wine is sour. You know, the sourness of the wine, I hope it reminds you of the sourness of the sin that you and I have committed that, re- that needed forgiveness. This meal is where Christ was willing to protect his betrayer. And I wonder how far the love, of mer- the love and mercy of Jesus would go. That the love and mercy and forgiveness that he has. I mean, is there a limit to Jesus' love? And before we get too quick to judge Judas, let's think about ourselves, shall we? Think about your own life. The times that I've sacrificed him with a kiss or a look or a word or a thought. Wouldn't that be the ultimate picture of Jesus' love in real life? To love God and love others so much that we're willing to protect those who want us dead. To love others so much that our hearts break for those who would commit the ultimate acts of destruction. To love the betrayer, the wayward spouse, the murderer, the adulterer, the molester, and pray for life change. To pray for terrorists, extremists, abortionists, prostitutes, porn stars, presidents, and former presidents, and ask that they would come to know Christ's love. That's the power of this table. That's what his grace does for us. That grace, that mercy, extended to his disciples, the boneheads that they were. It extended to Judas, though he didn't take it. It extends even to me. Because I'm called to remember all the ways that Jesus' love and mercy has protected me from the pain of my own schemes that, and the pain that my own schemes would bring in my own and other people's lives, even though I didn't see it at the time. Because you see, here's the thing. Sin can't be resolved without suffering. <laughs> As the age-old hymn that I love to sing says, Ye who think of sin but lightly, nor suppose the evil great, here may view its nature rightly. Here our guilt may estimate. You see, Monday Thursday shows us that on this night, God offers his mercy, his grace, and his love to the liar, the scoundrel, and the betrayer. The wound caused by my betrayal could only be solved by his betrayal. The knife that I've stuck in the back of others caused the nails to be driven through his hands and his feet. And the pain that I've caused, he felt for me. For by his wounds, we're healed. Tonight, as we finish the rest of this service and go our separate ways. I hope we take stock that this is the ultimate picture of Jesus' love in real life. Jesus loves us. Jesus loves us and others so much that he's willing to live and die and protect us, even us, so that in this meal and in this 
table, we can find his love, hope, and peace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that the peace which passes all human understanding would keep and guard all of our hearts and our minds in Jesus our Lord. And Lord, none of us in this room are perfect. None of us have attained perfection. All of us have sinned and fallen short of your glory. We're beating ourselves up. We're carrying burdens. We're walking with, with wounds that we've caused and wounds that have been caused against us. So tonight, Lord, we pray that we come before you with humble hearts, contrite, forgiving hearts. And we pray that we would receive the forgiveness you give and that we would give that forgiveness to others. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people say, amen. amen. At this time, we'll go